Good morning, Castleberry Baptist. So glad to celebrate Jesus Christ with you this Sunday morning. I am glad that you have tuned in to watch another episode of me talking to Nate's phone. Uh, I sure do miss each and every one of you. I'm trying to imagine all of your faces as we speak, since that's the only way we can uh, try to uh, envision this not being so different than what we're used to. But I am grateful for each and every one of you, and uh, I do miss each and every one of you, and I can't wait till we can get back together and we can celebrate in person uh, the life of Jesus Christ. But for now, we are making do with what we have. Uh, what an awesome Easter service we had last week. Uh, Brother Nate delivered an awesome uh, message and Pastor Powell did an awesome message. And uh, despite these circumstances, I believe the Lord's still blessing us in our church and I'm so grateful to him. And I'm grateful for every one of you tuning in today. I just ask that everybody who has a Bible, if you will, just prepare and turn to Acts chapter 4. We will be continuing a study that we have been going through in our companions class called Get Some Acts Right. And I think our church will be doing good to get some acts right in our life. I know I tell my children all the time they need to get some act right. And uh, I believe we do too. So turn to Acts chapter 4 and we're going to begin in verse 32. But first, I want to ask that you join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we're just so grateful, God, that you have given us your word, Lord. James, or 1 John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word is God, and we are so grateful, God, that you are here with us today. Lord, we just ask that you bless the reading of your Word, the studying of your Word, Lord, that you bless it to our lives. God, there's so many needs in our church. Uh, there's so many members of our church that are suffering right now financially, physically, spiritually, Lord. We desire your touch. We desire your presence, God. So I pray that our great Emmanuel, our great physician Jesus comes and visits every member of our congregation, every member uh, of this body. And Lord, I pray, God, that you just put your hands upon each and every one of my brothers and sisters. God, pour out a special blessing upon every one of them. And I ask for these things in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And like I said, we are trying or attempting to get some acts right. And we are studying from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35 to start with, and uh, liberated for loyalty is the subject of today's text. And as we, have ex as we examine this next set of verses uh, that outline loyalty within the church and the loyalty of the church, the loyalty that we're supposed to display to one another, to Christ, I'm reminded of a time I felt the need for much prayer at a church that I previously attended in Weatherford. I felt a disloyal spirit among us at one point, and uh, it was there. Just nobody had a deep relationship with each other, it didn't seem like. The circle seemed very small of fellowship, mo limited mostly to family, and those circles didn't really expand outside of those groups, and uh, there wasn't a lot of camaraderie. There wasn't a lot of uh, encouragement going from one another, not even a lot of fellowship going on in the church. And it was a very sad time in our church. We just felt like not just that we were split, but we were shattered. There were too many pieces that made up this body and none of them were connected. None of them were held together. And I felt a need to spend much time in prayer to fix this. And given our study today and given this awkward time of worship that we have to engage in and how difficult it is to uh, discipline ourselves to get in front of these screens and worship in this way. I also want to remind you that I know it's difficult to reach out to each other. We don't have a fellowship song where we can get up and we can hug each other and we can love on each other and we can shake each other's hands and we can ask each other how we're doing. So what we have to do is we have to call each other we have to reach out to each other and we have to talk to each other. And uh, I just don't want this spirit of disloyalty to each other to uh, invade our church. And it's been on my heart. Uh, it's been on the pastor's heart. It's been on our, a lot of our hearts, I'm sure. I'm sure all of you at home are thinking the same thing. There's some kind of distance that's happening between us. And, it, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it just doesn't feel good to the soul. And uh, I find it no coincidence as we have tumbled on through Acts all the way here into chapter four that we find ourselves in this time, in this world, in this moment where we're isolated, where we are drawn out from each other 
And then God puts this scripture right in our footsteps that we can divide the word of God and we can be reminded of the importance of reaching out and being loyal to Christ first and to each other second. And we need to remember to encourage each other. You know, this kind of disloyalty, this kind of uh, unbonded church would perplex any pastor. And it's, it's just natural to perplex the, plaster, the pastor. But what scares me more than that is how it can sneak up on the congregation and how it can embed itself within the, the body of believers and become a problem without any of us seeing it. The Bible says, beware of wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, it's because the devil is a master of camouflage and a master of division. I think we have to be alert. And I think we need to be uh, paying close attention to what's happening to the body of believers that is Castleberry Baptist. I'm here today to remind you all that we are to be as committed to each other as we are to Jesus Christ. The second greatest commandment tells us this much. We're to love each other just as much as we love ourselves, just as much as we love our Lord. Uh, we, are, we are one body. We're a uniform believer, and we have to be committed to each other. We have to reach out to each other. We have to understand each other. And in our previous study, we considered the gift of boldness and how the Holy Spirit gave us the strength to say what needed to be said, said to help our witness in talking about Jesus Christ, not being afraid to preach Christ and preach his resurrection and preach his miracles and, and to tell people that we're Christians. And that boldness is so powerful and so relevant in our lives right now. And, uh, and, and as we move on, now we turn our attention to the blessings that God has helped us to be for and with each other. The source of our courage and the source of the disciples' courage was displayed and fueled by the quality of life that they shared in fellowship with the other believers at this time. Luke describes the effectiveness of the early church. He talks about signs and wonders done among the people in Jerusalem. He talks about power being released through the apostles. We just talked about how the lame man was healed through the name of Jesus Christ by the hands of the apostles that they lifted him up and brought him to his feet, healing constantly. Thousands of lives are being changed by each one of these miracles, by each one of these sermons. Thousands were coming to know Jesus Christ. Reconciliations were happening. The rich are now getting along with the poor. The poor are getting along with the rich. Pharisees are leaving and joining the church of Christ. Reconciliation, real healings of spiritual health and real healings of physical health coming through the body of Christ through the church and there was joy and the evidence of the church and that it was alive is because of the Holy Spirit. The church was growing by thousands. It's over and over again throughout Acts, you'll see, and thousands were added to the church. Thousands, if you can imagine that. And it was dynamic. I want to ask you, Castleberry Baptist, would you like to be a part of a church like that? I sure would. I sure would. It's so amazing, the early church in Acts. We still can be a part of that church. We are that church. It's very simple, and we're going to go through some steps of how we get that kind of dynamic uh, power and that kind of uh, uh, relationship with God in our church and with each other that gives us these kind of encouraging feelings. The simple formula for a church like that is an unfailing commitment to Christ and to each other, an unrestrained loyalty to Jesus Christ and to each other, not only to the Lord, but each other. Luke gives us two illustrations, one to show us what loyalty really is and the other to alarm us as to what happens when it is lacking. The first is a very positive message, but the second is equally negative. Let's start reading from Acts chapter four and verse 32. And the multitude of those who had believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that of any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed 
to each as he had need. I'm gonna wet my whistle. Me and a couple of the guys spent a lot of time being slave drove over at Nate's house helping him construct a fence. He's a very hard boss to work for. If he asks you for help, just run. It has uh, been a long day for us, but a joy to serve our associate pastors. He spends a lot of time serving us, more time than most of us would ever consider. So church, I want to tell you, commitment is spelled like this. L-O-Y-A-L-T-Y. That's loyalty, Brother Brett. Oh, wait, I'm the one who can't spell or read. I apologize, Brother Nate. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 11, Luke uses the word church for the very first time. This passage is an excellent description of what the word meant to him. The Greek word used in 511 was ecclesia. Its original meaning was an assembly called together. Ek, E-K, means from or out of. Klesis is rooted in kaleo which means to call. In Luke's time, the word was used for a body of citizens called together to discuss the affairs of a local community or the state. Simply stated, it's called out and called together. Luke's tutor in faith was Paul. We sense that when Luke uses the word church, it carries the full implications of the apostle's mentor or, or teacher, uh, uh, Paul. For Paul, the fa his favorite phase of the church, he called the body of Christ. His letters to the Ephesians and the Corinthians express the powerful message. And if you're taking notes, write down Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And write down 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13 and 27. I'm going to read them for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 13 and 27 would be the second set. The church, which is, the, is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, Ephesians 1, 22 through 23. This is further explained vividly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now you are the body of Christ and the members individually. Paul goes on further to describe the interdependence of the members of the body as an example of how Christians are to be mutually dependent upon each other. And Luke, his faithful friend and companion, describes the birth and the growth of the church as Christ's body. We are called to be Christ's people, called to communion with him and each other, and together as a church to be the divine agent for the continuing ministry of his spirit. This early church had one thing that bound them all together. They agreed about the resurrected Christ. They also had him living within them. That prompted them to know what all that they had and where they all belonged. And that was in him and they belonged to him. Church, that's the most important thing. As all things common is, a, is not the phrase like we think that we all have the same favorite color or the same favorite sports team, but we agree on one thing then that's enough, that Jesus Christ lives, that he rose from the grave, that he died for me, he died for you, he died for Chris Powell, he died for this entire world, that we can all inherit a kingdom, that we not be orphans. He died for every one of us. If we can just have that in common, then we can be friends, that we can talk to each other, we can relate on something that's so much bigger and better than ourselves. And that's the point here. Paul, Paul describes that to us about this body and how important it is. The early church, they had that one thing that bound them together. Let's look at verses number 32 in, in chapter 4 where we all should be in our text. And the multitude of those who had believed were one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Sharing our material blessings may be much easier than the first and last parts of this verse of Scripture. 
The scripture here says they had one heart and one soul and they had all things common. And like I said, this doesn't mean that they all had the same favorite sports teams, the same favorite shows, the same favorite cars, but they shared each other's burdens. They agreed about all things Christ. We cannot be supportive of each other unless we know what is going on inside of each other. This verse explains an openness of one's personal difficulties and torn spiritual emotions, the heart and the soul. They're the most inner parts of our being. They're deep within us. And, and, and it said, the scripture says that they had one heart and one soul. How can you share your heart with your wife? You tell her everything. How can you share your heart with your church? Please don't tell us everything. <laughs> tell us your burdens. Tell us your needs. We want to be there for you. We want to share your heart. We want to share your soul. The heart and the soul are the most inner parts of your life. Share these secrets with each other that you may receive prayer and comfort. You may find that the persons you're sharing your secrets with has been through the same problems and can share with you how they overcame them. The body is designed to carry the load of all the members. My hand can't carry itself. It needs my arm. My arm needs my body and my body needs a head. Maybe one prettier than this, but it needs a head. Every, the, the body is designed to be carried by another member all the way up to the head. The church is designed in the same fashion. I've always had kind of a problem. I understand that uh, unspoken prayer requests are needed because there's somebody maybe present uh, that you don't want them to know you're praying for them. Or there may be something that you just can't make public. But I also believe that sometimes unspoken prayers are because you have too much pride to petition your congregation for your real needs. And I believe the Bible says to be specific in prayer. So I challenge you to think about your unspoken prayer requests. And if you really want to have them answered, then we need to give them to God the same way that you are giving them to God, to petition in the same way that you are. And, and unspoken prayers need to be reserved for those really unspeakable prayers that are just deep within your heart that you can't let out. But we really got to make sure that our own pride's not getting in our way, that we can't be afraid to go and say, I have a drinking problem. I have a, I have a pornography problem. I have a drug problem. I have a lying problem. I have a bad mouth problem. I can't help but cursing. Make sure that, that you're not calling those unspoken prayers because you're afraid of what your church might think about you. That's, that's the devil interfering with our oneness of our heart and our oneness of our soul. For this purpose, we have our men's prayer breakfasts, our Wednesday night prayer times, our prayer lists in general. It's an opportunity to open up to one another and not let our pride hide us from the help of Christ's body. Allow Christ's body to help you bear the load. Now, I know that we're under lockdown and that we're not attending our prayer breakfast or our Wednesday night prayers, but I've seen our prayer list this week and it is alive and it is working and we are using it. But if you have needs, your, your church body wants to help you carry those burdens. I promise you that. I, I know that there are many prayer warriors in this church who just who do not back down for an opportunity to pray for one of their loved ones or another member of their church. And we're here for you. And, uh, and we need to petition Christ's body on our behalf whenever we're under a siege from the enemy because he would have nothing better than to separate us the way we feel separated now in a lot of different pieces. He'd have nothing better to even separate us even more and to break us down even into smaller groups and smaller pieces. Congregations which are becoming infectiously alive have some strategy for members being together in smaller groups. More informal gatherings where the scriptures can be studied, needs and gratitudes can be shared, and prayer for one another offered. Prayer and Bible study groups enable this. So do classes which we already have, so do classes which we already have, in addition to being taught, show their mutual advantages in our lives and in, in, in this moving forward. I know our singles classes are not being attended like they were, and I know our companions and our women of worships and our seniors and senoritas classes have all been uh, socially distanced from each other. But you know what? If I can 
teach you this lesson through this phone, then I'm sure you can reach out to your companions class and your women of worship and you can check on each other and you can talk to each other in the same fashion that I'm reaching out to you in your home now. And these small Bible groups, they can be picked up at any time and we can gather in groups less than 10 and we can still have these small prayer groups to, to really strengthen the unity in this church and the bond in this church. And we should be doing that. According to Acts, it is the source of, of a powerful, unified body of Christ. We are the church, people. Can you imagine going through life without being able to place your name on a prayer list if ever you were to be in need? Or be able to talk to a fellow believer and have them share with you scripture that gives you a better outlook of your situation and gives you hope and joy and peace? Now just imagine that multiplied by the entire body of the church. Imagine struggling to know which person to call because you know any one of them that you call is going to be there to petition on your behalf, to, to testify to you of their trials and their tribulations, or to just listen and be there for you. Let's not make our groups too small. Let's try to expand our circles across the entire church. Let's, let's reach out to one another. Let everyone know that you are here for them, and I promise you in return they'll let you know that they're here for you also. But all this would not be possible without the assurance of loyalty. We all need a handful of people who are loyal to us and to whom are loyal because Christ's unwavering loyalty to us. You know, he is for us. He will not leave us or forsake us. Even if you fail, even if you fall, even if you succeed, it makes no difference to Christ. He is loyal to you. He is sold out to you. He died for you. This same kind of loyalty can be loosed inside of us through the Holy Spirit towards each other. Whether we win or fail, we need and deserve loyalty one to each other. When Jesus lives in our heart and soul, to repeat Luke's words, he enables his own loyalty within us first to him and then to other people. We'll open up our inner heart to share only when we have an assurance of loyalty which keeps confidence and supports us under the fire of criticism from others. Luke's example of that kind of person is Barnabas. I'm sure many of you have heard of Barnabas. And, and as we move through these scriptures, we move on to verse 36 and 37. And we're going to talk about Barnabas, the loyal encourager. And Joseph, who is also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. In verse 37, having land sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. If these two verses of scripture were all we had to tell us about the man of Barnabas, that would be merely enough for us to find him extremely admirable. His personality here described in scripture challenges us to wonder what kind of people we are in our church. What kind of name could we have for us in our church? He is an admirable man. And one that we would all be blessed to have in our own congregation. He sold everything he had and gave it to the apostles to take care of the church. We were told that his name was Joseph or Joseph as it is rendered in the RSV and that he was a Levite from Cyprus. The Levites were descendants of the tribe of Levi who assisted and served the priesthood in the sanctuary. They distributed tithes uh, to the needy and taught and interpreted the verdicts of the law. Joseph's home was in Cyprus where there was a strong colony of Jews and uh, but uh, separate had strong ties in Jerusalem because of members of his fa father's family who lived there. John Mark was Joseph's cousin. Tradition has it that the upper room where Jesus celebrated the Passover where we were at in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2 and, and where the other 120 believers were, where they celebrated his, the return of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, that was also the location of Mark's home. I believe through his ties to his cousin Mark, Barnabas, uh, through his ties, through his cousin Mark, is how he made his acquaintance to Jesus Christ. Barnabas was so captivated with the love of Christ he did not hesitate to sell all he had and give all the proceeds to the early church's needs and as well to the mission field. 
His sacrifices prompted the apostles to give him a new name, just as Jesus and God did in the Old Testament. This was a great honor, and usually it described the character of that person. And uh, the apostles who spoke Aramaic named him Barnabas. This name is power-packed, having the meaning, the meaning of son of prophecy. In Luke's Greek, however, uh, we have ref reflection not just of the translation into another language, but the intimate personal observation by the physician of which can be rendered son of consolation, exhortation, or encouragement. It is exciting to understand that that same basic word was used to translate Jesus, Aramic promise of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, verses 16 through 18 says, And I will pray thee, Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and will be in you, and I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. In this case, the Greek word for helper or counselor is Parakletos, which means one who is called to one side to help, who strengthens and help us to stand. Joseph had clearly displayed an inherited inclination towards being that kind of person. I love this. The spirit of the Lord had disguised himself in Joseph. Every time we see Barnabas, as we move through Acts, he is helping, he's encouraging, he's affirming, he's uplifting. He's untiring and claiming the best for the people. The true nature of life, the body of Christ, is the fellowship of the, the daughters and the sons of encouragement. We're called to stand with each other, helping each other to learn from difficulties and the, re and the rejoice fully in the delights of life. We're called out and called into a loyal assembly of believers. As I move this closing couple verses of scriptures. I want you to write these verses down. Ephesians chapter four, verses one through three. And then we'll jump over to verses 30 through 32. And I need you to listen, church, as I read these verses to you. They're very powerful. And I need you to understand that this is a imperative that we get this right, especially now, now that we don't have our fellowship song and that now that we aren't able to gather like we have and have our, our, uh, fellowship dinners or luncheons or lady luncheons. And I mean, we just all are feeling so detached from each other. I want you to really listen. Ephesians chapter four. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in bond of peace. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also had forgiven you. We need to fill our church with people like Barnabas. We need to become like Barnabas. We could all give more. We can all encourage more. We can all love more. We can all reach out more. So I want to ask you, church, have you been reaching out more? There's people in this church that are, are suffering and lonely. And the only companionship that some of them have is the one that they got there in our church building. And they've been hewn off from it. They've been cut off from it. It's like an amputation amongst our body of believers. We can't, we can't satisfy the itch on an arm that is not present. So we have, to, we have to reach out to that arm. We have to pray for that arm. We have to seek the needs of that body, of that piece of that body, that member. And we have to do what we have to do to supply the needs that that body has. Call your brothers. Call your sisters. Text them. Email them. Do whatever you have to do. But let's keep our communication to each other open. 
Let's remain loyal to each other. Do you not know that we are going to spend the rest of eternity together? There'll be plenty of time to ignore each other when we get to heaven, but now is not the time or the place. We need each other. We need to reach out to each other constantly, weekly, daily. Check in on each other. Love each other. Let everyone know that we're here. Unfortunately, we cannot have an entire church full of Barnabases. And in our next study, we're going to talk about how we have to endure Ananias and Sapphira's. So as we tune in next time, maybe a couple of weeks, uh, I really want you working on your Barnabas character. And we're going to talk about the other side of the tracks. God bless all of you. So grateful for y'all giving me this time to worship with you. And I love you all. I can't wait to see you soon. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we're just uh, here on bended knee, God, just begging you, Father, to show us the needs of your body. Lord, put a burning desire in our heart to serve this body, to serve the people of this body, Lord. And I pray that you give us a discerning spirit, God, that a name jumps into our mind right now, God, of somebody who we need to talk to. Lord, I pray that you give us a name of somebody we need to apologize to. Lord, I pray that you give us a name of somebody that we need to tell we love them and we're thinking about them, God. I pray that you give us a name in our mind and in our heart, somebody who has a need, God, and tell us what that need is that we can meet it. Lord, I pray that you help us to bear each other's burdens. Lord, your word says that a threefold cord is stronger than any twofold cord, God, and, and this cord is tethered, Lord. I ask that you bind us together that you tie us back together through this, this prayer, through this service, Lord, as we are seeking your will for our lives in this uncertain time. God, I know your will right now is to unify your body through this church, Lord, and I pray that you put names in our hearts, Lord, and you don't give us rest, and you don't give us sleep, and you don't give us comfort, and you don't give us peace until we unify this body, God, in a way that is pleasing to you. And I ask your blessing upon this message in the name of Jesus. Amen.